Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. We're going to look at Ninja High School number one and, and maybe a little bit of an overview of Ben Dunn's uh, Antarctic Press and Ninja High School Empire. Before we dive into this one, I want to invite everybody watching to like, follow, and subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that bell icon to be notified when we post new videos. It'll give you a leg up on the kayfabe effect. Sometimes uh, whenever we run these videos, the comic we highlight disappears quickly from the aftermarket or it goes up in price. So if you have that notification turned on, you'll be the first one trying to track down whatever comic you want from that day's video. Also, let the video play through to the end. That allows YouTube's algorithm to share it with other comics fans who haven't found Cartoonist Kayfabe yet. It's one of the primary ways we grow this channel, and we appreciate your help in that. And now, Ed, let's go down a, uh, a rabbit hole of Amera manga comics, of black and white comics, of small press self-published comics that have kind of gone on to be a pretty impressive legacy. You see Antarctic Press from the beginning. This is issue one of Ninja High School. 1986 is the, is the date on the cover. I think this actually was January 87 when it was published. But Antarctic Press has published a lot of books since then. And uh, what are we looking at there? Almost... 35 years of, of publishing I feel like it's not these aren't comics I hear a lot of people talk about I think they were uh, today you know you have people who just read manga or just read YA or just read Spider-Man this is one of those comics before it was like broke into all those little sections this is when it was like alternative comics or mainstream comics but then there was also manga before manga was really something we all understood and, and read uh, been done on the front end of that. Yeah, for sure, man. And uh, there was that very small window of time where it would, like, Kamiko got the Maycross Robotech license, and yes. you would get, it would be guys like Doug Rice, yep. who who had that energy. They saw that shit. They got the bootlegs of, like, the uh, the giant robot stuff, the Go Nagai shit. And they brought that to, uh, to American comics. And Ben Dunn, certainly at the forefront of the stuff, uh, long publishing history and most of it manga related but then you would get stuff like he's the initial publisher of like box office poison right and our friend jason lex had the awful science fair so he would branch out I, there was there was something called um the snowman or something yes Do you remember that i think mm -hmm. that was an antarctic press that was a viable place where you could submit things and have have the work uh potentially be published warrior nun uh Areola was, was one of the titles. <laughs> <laughs> Am I mispronouncing that? Uh, during the Bad Girl uh, era, you know, this was a series, like, there are several series of this that, that came out. So a viable publisher, not just self-publishing, but publishing quite a few books, especially if you were to assemble kind of the history, did a, did a Popeye comic. You mentioned, you know, Mongazine was one of them. That um, Doug Rice, Dynamo Joe stuff, I believe he was a fill-in artist on that book, Ben Dunn. Uh, being the he there, uh, fill an artist on there. But this is an intro from the Malibu collection of Ninja High School, the first four issues. You just tell the graphic design of it is totally... Uh, <laughs> I what, love the early eternity, trade paperback. Eternity yeah, comics. totally. But he gives a little bit of background. You know, I don't have all the answers. Ben Dunn, come on and let's talk shop sometime about this stuff. But, but lived in, I believe, Taiwan for a little bit when he was young, and that's how he was exposed to manga at an early age. And it became, you know, a huge influence on him as a cartoonist and an artist, which is what we're going to see in this Ninja High School number one. I would say top five titles in, in comics history. Ninja High School. So, so evocative. Absolutely. Uh, there would always be a little thumbnail of Ninja High School comics in price guides and shit. Uh, Wizard, Overstreet, all those kinds of places. Uh, so, like, you would, you would see it. It would be ubiquitous. Every shop would get a copy or two whenever the next one would come out. And we're talking a long legacy. Like right here, this, oh, is, yeah. this is issue 163 of Ninja High School. Yeah, and I think this is the, the second volume possibly because it comes out at one point it relaunches in color. And I think that that color series might be, you know, 75 issues in or more. Um, this is your first press release for it. And it even lays out, you know, uh, it, it's a, in the tradition of very popular Japanese manga uh, combined with Archie comics. So, you know, kind of knew what he had from the get-go, but you're right about the title. To me, the title is really the piece. We think of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as being the perfect title. Ninja High School, dude, it's right there. That's about as good of a comic book title as I can think of. Season finale uh, of uh, season three, 
of uh, Cobra Kai, or it was it season two where they have that big fight? <laughs> like that's what you really want, right? Yes, and f- the first ad for it almost looks like a movie poster. Like you see, a, presumably a school in the background, and like giant mech, a helicopter, action. He does all this stuff right, man. A lot of a lot of great stuff from the get go. So. Um, let's dive into issue one and, and we'll kind of talk as we go on this You know, I think this, like, once again, like you said, we, we need Ben Dunn to do a shoot interview with us uh, to, to, to get everything right. But I do have projections and ideas of certain things. Uh, one of those things being that I think this might be one of those deals where, at a t- you know, at this time there were plenty of publishers. This could be almost like the, like the Reggie Byers thing with a Shuriken where you submit it places but like gary groth ain't publishing this right so you go into business for yourself and i think it hit you know he came out at the right time he did and so i'm referencing a bunch this ninja high school 20th anniversary special um has all kind of cool stuff but here is the very first like a mini comic he said he printed a hundred of these in 86 took him to Baycon, sold every copy um you know if, if you're a working cartoonist at that point that's your sign. Yeah. You know, like you, you understand like, okay, the, the parts are lined up, the title's right, let's do this. And so it could also be after bouncing around and doing some work for, you know, work for hire kind of stuff that you go, oh, this thing I'm interested in that I'm, that I'm self-publishing on a small scale, let's, let's bank on myself. And it certainly seems like it has paid off well. Yes. Certainly, it at least remained in business for a long, long time. And I, I can't not look at this black and white explosion ad absolutely the titles that are on there man that is such a sweet spot for me and it's it's kind of cool to see all of that and this this dealer of comics is out of san antonio texas which is where antarctic press is based makes me wonder uh if this is a piece of of his business as well so the know, inside front cover well i mean maybe distribution or something you know because he's certainly on the indie side of comics and you're doing a black and white book at the height of the black and white explosion there's so many distributors at the time who knows? I, I never know what anybody's business model is for this stuff. In order to give some context to the people at home who might be curious, there are, at this point, when Ninja High School 1 comes out, there are only two issues of Mark Bloodworth's Night Streets out uh, on, the, on the racks. <laughs> Shouts to Mark, man. He's a kayfaber. Yeah, that, that's quite a list. You know, I linger on some of these where it's like, pause and read some of these lists of uh, what is out there at the time. Two issues of Craig Storman's Labor Force. Nice. But... Let's dive into this. You know, right away you see kind of a fun, lighthearted, cartoony style, and you see uh, the trademarks of both manga and, uh, and the early manga that was coming here and Amer- Amer- manga. It, it's, it's, it's all here, man. And this, the level of craft with the drawing is all I need in comics to have a good time. But he even picks up on certain things like the tech in manga will be traced, you mm. know, and... And so he has those bits. Like you showed the original ad and it had the fucking Huey right. Apache helicopter or whatever. He traced that. But that's what you do in manga. That's what you do in comics in a lot of cases. Quagmire High, the name of the high school. Very, very uh, appropriate, I think. Yeah. And the story with that reference to Archie is that pretty much two girls show up at this school interested in our main guy there on the bike on page one. Uh, Feeple is his name. And they both like him. So it's kind of the Betty and Veronica. Yeah, I love that. This kind of stuff. It's it's like still a leg in American comics because you know what he's going for in terms of manga. But even like he probably still had limited manga, really. Like so he had to kind of develop some of his own language in certain ways uh, because it does kind of still read like a black and white American comic in, in so many ways. The panel, panel structure and things is very, very American. Uh, we just don't have a... We just don't have a page volume where you can do appropriate manga comics in America on any cost-effective level, certainly all by yourself. Yeah, he covers a good bit of ground here. We're going to be introduced to you know the entire cast, and uh, they all get a few pages of whatever their motivation and origin is. In this case, she wants to take over this ninja clan, and her grandfather's like, you're not ready to do that. Challenge me to a fight to decide if you, if, you know, if, if I win, I'm still in charge and you have to do what I say. And there's one of your manga tropes, right? Like when it's time to fight, grandpa's this giant 20-foot undefeatable fighter. 
And uh, you so, don't even see the fight. No, she's immediately humbled. <laughs> yes, and the result is she's got to go to this school in America and mar- get this guy to marry her <laughs> to take over the clan. Yeah, it, it's 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 super funny. And and one of the things with self published comics is you may or may not have an editor. I would say that Ben Dunn probably doesn't. Uh, you must learn some humility, granddaughter. Therefore, I'm sending you to the United States. I don't know that America is the place to find humility. <laughs> yeah, things are different, I guess, in the mid-80s <laughs> than they are now. <laughs> uh, to, an ext- there's, there's, to an extent, because of the breezy speed of this and the kind of non-sequitur nature or just the, the absurdity, and I mean that in, a, in the good sense of the word, um, it feels like a manga parody. You know what? He says that... Let's see. I think it's in this. Because there are several places where Ben Dunn shows up as a cartoonist and kind of gives some background about the book or whatever. And what he describes, I think it's in this one, is it couldn't be a parody. He realized that. But it it was going to be like a good time. And you know what? I don't see it. I don't think it's in... Oh, yeah, here it is. I had to make it so that it wasn't heavy-handed parody but just plain fun. Yeah. So there are those elements. Like, it is... it, It does have a sense of humor. Yes. Which... You know, I don't know how many of those 80s black and white books. I guess some of them have some humor in there, but I found that very welcome. I like that almost parody-like tone. It reminds me of the tick in places. Sure, it, but, it, but it feels like he's, tr- like he's trying to approximate manga by having very limited resources of manga. So, like, you see maybe if you have a small case sample and then you have to, like, use pattern recognition... It could be different than what the overarching idiom of manga is. And he's he definitely has shown in manga in his collection. Like that's that's what you get from this. You know that he has shown in jumps, at the very least, man. Yeah, prepping for this again. This is why we need to talk to him. Yes, I, I found lots of stuff, and I can't put my finger on all of it, but of different different books that would be influential at the time. Um, you know, and I don't know how he's getting this stuff. If he's exhibiting at uh, Baycon, you know, like some of these cities, especially on the coast, had manga presence. You know, you could go to the manga bookshop in New York, or I'm sure San Francisco. Uh, and scoop up everything you could carry, right? Bring that extra suitcase along and just pack it full of stuff. RNC Incorporated, rival Ninja Clan headquarters. That's great. I mean, that, that, that could have been a Ben Dunn joke, right? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> uh, and so this is another one of these characters. This is our rival Ninja Clan, and guess what? He has eyes on marrying her, and now she's going to America. He needs to find who this boy is that she's supposed to marry so he can kill him. So you're creating good conflict. Yeah. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's immediate, because there's also going to be you know, a, a chick going after the dude. So you have two conflicts. My one beef with the comic is just that our guys kind of look they similar. They do look similar. I'm with you. And uh, that could have been solved super easy, but it's, you know, it's this is a young cartoonist, fresh in the game. Uh, these, But that's, that's the only beef. The storytelling is all clear, uh, but you just run a major risk with these two boy characters. Yeah. You at least have a blonde with cat ears and a brunette to separate your Betty and Veronica, but we need a jughead. We need a, a crown on some dude or something. Absolutely. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comics that Ed Piscor and I make. Red Room Trigger Warnings, the second season of Red Room, all self-contained stories, issues one to four, now available in comic shops everywhere. Red Room, the anti-social network, the trade paperback collection of the first season of Red Room, now available in comic shops everywhere, minus 28 countries where it's banned in 10 comic shops, but you can still request it there. And coming in September, the collection, the trade paperback of Red Room Trigger Warnings will be in stores in September. You can pre-order that now at your local comic shop or online wherever you buy your books. Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness in comic shops everywhere. The 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk. I am writing, drawing, lettering, coloring the Grand Design treatment, retelling that 60-year history. And you can now pre-order the Hulk Grand Design Oversized Treasury Collection. Uh, About 40 extra pages in that. It'll be in stores before Christmas, but you can pre-order it now in your comic shops or in your bookstores wherever you buy comics. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. We have our cartoon uh, professor teacher character who's going to be around. And you can imagine a thorn in the side of the kids, right? Nearly Chester Brown. (laughs) Really? That's amazing. You're so right. (laughs) Man, that's 100%. And you can see 
from uh, the, the cutaway. We're going like zooming out, zooming out into outer space because the other love interest, our, our Veronica that's going to show up, is an alien princess. So, dude, he's a early adopter of like furrydom with with these characters and shit. And I love, you know, you know, it gets the it gets the dick hard when the lettering tools change, man, to give you an indication <laughs> of the different species using that chisel tip marker that comes with calligraphy sets. And these look like dropped in high res, uh, high contrast photos. Going Kirby, dude. Yeah, yeah, some collage stuff. And you know that spaceship again. Talk about like manga tells or whatever. That kind of detailed spaceship to me is something I would associate early in uh, seeing like some manga. Yeah. Or anime for that matter. And here we go, our alien princess that's going to come down. And for whatever reason, man, that Jeremy uh, Jeremy Feeple is uh, very popular. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's we're, going after. Maybe him. we discover. Uh, what's going on? This makes me think of, uh, I don't know if you had it uh, when you were young. Well, I guess you wouldn't have because it was when I was young. There was a show called Zoobly Zoo with very well-designed animal costumes and shit. And that's, I, I bet that's that's like one of the early sort of fetishes of uh, furrydom was Zoobly Zoo. <laughs> that's funny. But there was like a fox dude that looked like it. What is going on? A naked girl? It's manga, baby. Would have stood out, right? In, in 1986, I mean, how many comics are you grabbing? You know, think of the Marvel DC stuff, certainly. Comics Code approved titles. This would have been out of standout. Yeah, still tastefully done. Like, uh, Antarctic will have, like, a hentai kind of line at a certain point. And she's heading to Earth now with her mission. It's all set up, dude. It's all set up there for us. You know, we, we, we know our immediate conflict. Here's our moose character, uh, Arnie, who is, uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think we know who's being referenced whenever the character's named Arnie and looks like this. Yeah, the guy from Contra. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he's called Arnie, but he has like a uh, like Rambo gimmicks going on. So, so he's both guys from Contra put together. Absolutely. This feels like a manga page. It does. Rama Half is uh, one of the books that, that I read, you know, was an influence uh, on yeah. Ben Dunn. So, you know, that feels almost like exactly uh, like a layout you might see in there. Also, by the way, kind of the image guys. You know, we often talk about them having Jay some, some and shit. manga influence. Well, any of those where it's like Cable is standing there, you know, outside of the panels. It's, it's your anchor on the page. Yeah, but specifically, you could just put Fairchild or yeah. Freefall into that image right there. A uh, big storytelling no-no, by the way, like when you're composing your own pages, you don't want your character to be bleeding into like the last panel and kind of funk up the flow a bit like that. Makes me think, though, that is your uh, bringing in your manga influence, you know, like breaking some of those American layout rules. I suppose. And uh, he runs the shower after his soccer game after gym class to get cleaned up to show her around the school. And whenever she uh, steps out of the, the shower, she's standing basically in the shower seeing him. Yeah. And he has nothing to hide, so he pulls his gimmicks <laughs> down. I don't know if he pulls them down or if they drop whenever he gets indignant. But either way, she's getting a show. In, in another one of those weird storytelling things. That's interesting. So, if you know, I always think, like, the people that do this, they're, they're, mon they're uh, like, manga fans because manga reads a different direction. Like, we would normally have a tall panel on the left. Yeah. But if you're reading, you know, right to left, then you would have your tall panel on the right. And I think that's maybe where that convention comes from. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the interesting thing about Ninja High School and Ben Dunn's work in particular is that it is laid out like an American comic with the, the same volume of panels, the same level of readability, uh, but it, the varnish is manga. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, you know, like it's, it's a real mashup. He's also a good cartoonist. You know, you see stuff like the cartoony stuff, oh, characters yeah. bouncing around. But even I love this stuff where, yes. like, the hands are repeating to show motion and the, working with the sound effects. It's very effective. So now we've got two girls here, and she wastes no time. Jeremy, marry me. And uh, no, that's not going to sit well. Yes. Arnie shows up because he thinks he hears an explosion and just fires off a few rounds. <laughs> I feel like that character may not age well. Right, or, or it's just a precursor of, th of things to come. Yeah, it could be. But daggers coming out of their eyes, the, the uh, drawn like storm clouds above their heads of anger. It's all good stuff. All that, all that manga idiom. And our ninja spy, 
trying to track this down, except it's not the ninja spy. It's a kid brother. <laughs> <laughs> Cutting up the cake that was supposed to be for uh, later something special after dinner, and now she's going to have to make another cake. This also has that 80s sensibility to me of, like, cartoons. You know, mm-hmm. this feels so much like a scene you would see in some after-school yes, cartoon. Spike Witwicky would do that. There are little parts, man, where he's fighting, drawing his regular style. You know, like, I I don't know that... He, I mean, I'm sure he naturally is, like, a mangaka now. But, like, that's... There's elements of just regular noses in there. You know, it looks like a, a dog snout or something. Yeah, our professor, it's almost a, just a, a, almost an American drawing. Yeah. Or Canadian. Yeah. Yeah, North, North American comics of some sort. It is fun to see that, uh, that mashup of styles. And you can see why, like, this why would take it, off. Yeah, that's why we call it a Maramanga. Right. Because nothing else, I mean, how much could have been done like this? Like, they have the, an ad for Mangazine, which is another Antarctic Press publication, and another one of those, like, if you liked manga, I'm sure you were picking that up because you had two choices right you know in 1986 tiger x is dope as hell man yeah it's neat to see what these pieces are you know uh magazine being an anthology so some of this stuff having a life uh far beyond there and then a backup of arnie gives a speech um show and tell <laughs> yes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'll leave it at that i really like some of the art in here and Ben Don, I think, is just doing inks on this story. This feels very much like an 80s black and white explosion comic absolutely, to me. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this is almost a Ken Langra face. Totally. All hatched out. Uh, like I said, man, when it comes to the art making, like, this is all I need to have a good time reading comics. I love the enthusiasm of the issue. I love the lack of care for, like, Ames lettering guide. I was going to say the lettering has that, that quality. Totally legible but still full of humanity and very congruent with the art style. I have very little criticism about the aesthetics, man. Beyond, beyond just the two guys looking the same. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that 100%. Uh, back issue, or back cover, we're going to show issue number two, you know, plug that a little bit. But if you look at the fine print down here, it's information on the distributors, and it's a whole list, you know. So if you're a comic book uh, store, it's kind of basically telling you how to put this in into your, you know, put it put it on your stands. And heroes aren't hard to find listed in this um, distributor list. Yeah, who knew Uncle Shelton also distroed comics? You would hear about this now and then the way these distros would work because it'd be like a few local stores, you know, would kind of I don't know pull together or have like one big operation where they could go and maybe plug in some uh, some missing issues if something took off if they needed something for a customer. Uh, work together a little bit so quickly before we completely wrap this up i did want to showcase this class reunion 20th anniversary special um as you mentioned at the top ben dunn part of the books that he sent to us but it showed and there he is in the front you know giving some background so 20 years in this walks through all of these issues what they were whatever notes are uh, interesting about them eternity published this for a little bit yeah it starts out with the antarctic press and then runs through eternity for a bit um quite a while maybe better distribution or something like that wider higher maybe you get a page rate also you know maybe maybe you make a couple of dollars and then return to antarctic press with issue number 40 so a big run astonishing to think that eternity lasted that freaking long but that probably speaks a lot toward ben dunn's or the ninja high school team's uh whatever you want to call it the reliability because maybe they they hit their marks month in month out the entire tenure of eternity comics existence that's very true and then it relaunches as a full color uh book in ben sent us a lot of stuff man. <laughs> yeah check, that's true check these gimmicks out but in, in the 90s like it comes back out yeah you showed that one 163 these things end up coming out as a volume two in full color and you know we often talk about cartoonists that leave their posts Story and art is still been done. Yeah. You know, he's got a colorist working on this, but you can see like he's again investing in himself, putting in the digital coloring, the production, and continuing to uh, move forward with this thing. Hundreds of issues. The chops have grown too, man. Like this is really, really solid. Yeah, you can definitely see that development. But when you think about manga in North America, 
this is a comic that really uh, probably had a positive influence on that. Sure. You know, building an audience and, and proving that there was an, a receptive audience out there waiting for this material. And uh, one we'd last re- one. We'd be remiss. <laughs> I didn't know when else we would show this. But uh, an STD talks about STDs and what people should know. This was a free comic. So there's been a few of these that are done for different reasons, some locally. But in this case, uh, Dunn's brother is a doctor and said that, you know, there are movies and TV shows and books and all this stuff to talk about this stuff. Why aren't there comics? So Ben Dunn said, sure. And uh, they collaborate on this thing. Interesting to see like the lettering and markup because it looks different when he's doing this free comic, this public service announcement style comic approaches it a little bit different. I assume he looked at it and thought color is uh, more likely to find an audience more expensive to produce. And then I wonder about the lettering, if it's something where his brother like wrote it, sent it to him, you know, in some kind of word file and it was like printed out and, and paste it down. But uh, kind of an, an odd object. If you're into weird comics, this might be one you want to add to your collection. It looks like it's uh, watercolor or markers or a combination. I was going to say blue, blue line colored. 1992. So, you know, maybe right before digital color would have entered and, and become the norm. So a tiny taste of, uh, of Ninja High School, one of the successful indie series of all time. Yeah, yeah, very cool to uh, give this a look, man, because it is ubiquitous in all the comic book mag- magazine price guides. You would always see it on the shelf. They would Every store would get a copy or two. Hey, it's remarkable for any series to last decades. You know, I tip my cap to them. Absolutely, man. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel at the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design, the Treasury Edition, the big oversized graphic novel collection, will be in stores in December, but you can pre-order that now at your local comic shop or online. It'll make a perfect Christmas gift for yourself or the Hulk fan in your life. Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive, my Image Comics full-color Street Angel collection, was out of print, and it'll be back in print in August. Again, you can have your store pre-order that copy, so the day it's available, it'll be in your pool box. And join me on patreon.com slash jimrug, where you can see a lot more of my art, uh, Q&A process, and you can download some of my out-of-print zines and mini-comics there. This Gold Digger comic from 2021, man, so still in effect. Red Room Trigger Warnings, uh, trade paperback on a hit store shelves in September. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. Red Room Trigger Warnings uh, is going to be my 10th book in 10 years, man. Super proud of that accomplishment. Hope you support the project. Uh, if the comic is banned in your country or if it's banned uh, in your comic shop, hit up the link tree in the description below this video and you'll be able to order and pre-order current and future Red Room comics. Hit up my Patreon. Three bucks will get you the archive there and you could read all of Red Room, the Antisocial Network and all of uh, Red Room trigger warnings there for just three bucks. Like I said, what else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cart cartoonist kayfabe t-shirts merchandise fanny packs also at the links below this video it's another great way to support the cartoonist kayfabe channel jimmy give them the marching orders will be on our way read more manga